Why'd you bring me up here? I think we got a huge opportunity to finally reveal what our true family is. An opportunity for us to tell people the story of how we came about. Yeah, because people have so many questions all the time. So many questions about what made us who we are today. And really where it starts from is our patriarch, dad. That's right. And so what I think we should do is, is open up the doors to a podcast where we talk about how at one point dad was an orphan. Yeah. And he has built an empire. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Let's do this. Hi, Dad. Hey, buddy. I want to tell you something. I appreciate you. And I love you. And I'm proud of you. And so what we need to do is you need to show the rest of the world how you've done what you've done. The way we're going to do that is with conversations. Okay? Yeah. So one of the conversations that we're going to start with is how you've become the man that you've become today. Okay, I told you when we did this, I didn't want to make it about me. I want to make it about our faith, our family, our friends, and how we need to change our county, our state, and our nation in a little bit of impact on the world. I understand that you want to explain to the world who uh, we are, and who I am in the process it took uh, to get that. And so with that being said, I, I don't have any problem doing that, but I'm not going to make uh, our podcast about me. We're going to have What like, would you say the American dream is? Let me elaborate a little bit more. You are a man that's had nothing. At one point, you had absolutely nothing. You had a pair of socks with holes in them. Yeah, well, materi- lived- materially. Sure, great point. So tell me what someone that is watching you this podcast right now can expect from an American dream in 2022? Wow, that's, uh, first of all, um, we're talking about challenges today are not the challenges when I was a kid. Uh, Not for me personally and not for the world. All right, so um, when I was eight years old, I had the greatest life of I was so spoiled. I had the greatest life of I, I, honest truth, and I, and I'm not exaggerating of anybody on the planet. I had the absolute greatest mom in the world. Um, I had a dad that was connected to uh, my mom's family, who were um, all from Lebanon, and um, they were all about family, all about uh, love. Uh, God about uh, country and so this family loved me I there was uh, 13 of us uh, that lived in the same home and it was all my aunts and my uncles my mom and dad of course I had a brother um, and a cousin and um, I was the only child. The The youngest person close to me was my brother. He was 11 years older than I was. And I was the center of everybody's life. It was, uh, they called me Billy, and just like we do Billy. And um, there was, I remember, and I can show pictures of uh, Christmas, and the tree that we had, my Aunt uh, Lee always put up the tree, and it was a silver Christmas tree. The presents went up to midway. Obviously, there's 13. If you have two presents for everybody, uh, there's 26 presents, but there was more than that, and most of them were mine. That's how spoiled I was. Now, when you say 13 13 other adults, I'm assuming. Yeah, there was 13 adults. You were the only kid with Uncle Mike and Yeah, my my brother was. uh, So if I was eight, obviously he's 19. Um, and he would have been the second youngest, but he was a young adult. So the rest were adults. Yeah, all adults. Sure. Yeah. How did I, how did you guys do your finances back then? Okay, so everybody had um, their own uh, job. Everybody worked. Everybody, and except for me, obviously. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom, part time. She worked 
at um, a place called Vernon Downs, which was a horse track that's still in business. Yeah. So everybody contributed the same pot? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody contributed. And then there was a, a certain um, amount that was kept out each person. Now, my, I ha- like my Aunt Lee, my Aunt Vi, my Aunt May, my Uncle Mike, they all were single at the time would keep their a little bit of money everybody to themselves for personal spendable income yeah like for buying a car or also a substantial amount of money not just a little oh not not substantial because i would say if i was to guess most half of their money went to the expenses of the family and you know the 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 blessing is Everybody was so in love with everybody. This is why I say I had the perfect family, that nobody cared. You know, my Aunt Lee uh, made the most money. She was the first woman Teamster boss of the Milk Fund, which was a fund that the Teamsters started so that people that were inside the Teamsters, if they ran into a, um, a hard time, uh, sh- a hardship of sorts that they would uh, give money out of this fund. Uh, discretionary. It was a discretionary fund. Yeah, discretionary that- basis. So you could come <laughs> and plead your case that my husband was a teamster, died in a in a trucking accident, and we need money to get on our feet. And the teamster milk fund would take care of him. It wasn't that really how how Jimmy Hoffa got in trouble. Yep, yeah, her. Uh, my Aunt Lee and Jimmy Hoffa and another Teamster boss were indicted for uh, misappropriation of funds. And they tried to stick it uh, uh, to them. And Jimmy t- took responsibility for everything. They didn't have enough to go to, to really to go to trial. And so he, he settled with never to be a Teamster um, president again. Hmm. Short of it is, is uh, you're- he became Teamster boss again. He he didn't he um, said screw the government um, after he got he did a short prison stay for that and uh, he said screw the government and went back and uh, become the Teamster president again. So that your whole family contributed to the finances to, for the greater good is what I'm understanding. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the family was the family, um, and everybody. We were all living under one roof. So there, we had, you know, when you live as a family like we do, you know, there's so much extra money um, as long as you can get along and share it and not be greedy about it. That because you know you live under one roof, you know you share all the expenses of life, and uh, it's the best way to live. But unfortunately, uh, and I, I say the enemy, he's infiltrated the family and he's trying to destroy it. Uh, if it was up to um, the liberals of today, everybody would live in a little cubicle by themselves, not talk to their neighbors, not talk to their family. And live as though they don't even they 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 live for themselves. They, it's a big I I me me uh, lifestyle. And wow, people that have emotional problems. All these things are just record levels. It doesn't work. So you grew up. You grew up with thirteen other individuals, and you shared finances. I I grew up with thirteen adults. I was the only um, juvenile. I was the only right. kid in the house, and I was spoiled. And I had the greatest family. The love um, that the uh, Lebanese people, my family. I mean, I'm sure there's you every, know, cul- every culture. Every culture, yeah. yeah. But, but especially Lebanese seem I, to be uh, family oriented. The, the the think back of how I was surrounded, Blake, um, by so much love, by so much love. How'd that change? So um, I would consider my mom to be the hub of uh, the community of my family, okay? Now, what I mean by that is not just the people that lived in our house, but she was so uh, loving and tender and and big-hearted that she would be um, the arbitrator between, uh, for instance, if, 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 if two people got in an argument 
and there there was not a, a there was no way really to say one is one person is right and the other's wrong it's just a matter of opinion my mom was the kind of person that would say guys i love you and it would snap the two people that were arguing's minds back to what are we what are we talking we're talking about if you like peas or not and we're arguing about it and so what she did is she brought everybody back to ground zero in in relation to the family so when my mom got cancer she got breast cancer and this was in 1967 8 67 there was no uh what do you want to call it treatment per se and the first thing they did um i i remember that it was close to uh, easter and i remember uh that my aunt may saying to my aunt lee i just got back uh from the hospital because my mom was in the hospital and they're gonna do a double mastectomy i'm standing uh uh, behind a chair just listening and they don't even know it and that was I'm seven years old at that point and it was I I was I was scared in my life is that is that when you realized that she had breast cancer is that when you were told or were you told prior to that no I was told before that but uh, you know I I seven years old I didn't and it's and cancer was n- kind of not new but it was yeah, like, eight years old what, what, what what's that word yeah I don't, you don't even re- probably realize what it is yeah I, I I was scared because um you know when somebody says they're gonna cut anything you know even make an incision you know even as a kid and I, I was thinking through a kid's mind I uh I got scared and it was the first time that I, I knew my mom had breast cancer and cancer but it was like you know it'll all be good you know at seven years old you know you're like you're living for the moment you, you know you're you living way that God tells us to by the moment you don't know heartache not at all zero I was and it sounds I, like before that you never knew heartache. You knew none. love and affection and none a, a free state of 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 joy. Right? I was spoiled. Yeah, I was absolutely unequivocally spoiled. Yeah, spoiled with love. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I I I don't think I was a rotten kid. You know where you think oh this kid throws tantrums. I never did that as a kid. Um, Allegedly. Uh, no, I I, I never I, I wasn't one of those types of kids. Uh, because I would have got my butt beat. I was, I would mean beat uh, by an any ex- one of my aunts. Yeah, there's an expectation of you being a certain type of kid. Yeah, but sure. when I mean, when I mean I was spoiled, mm-hmm. I was spoiled from the aspect that um, I had all this love given to me and um, anything material I wanted uh, at seven years old, obviously they could afford it because it was toys. Um, I had everything I wanted, everything I wanted. I had a, an older brother that was in college, I, you know, and uh, I was his little brother, his buddy, and my dad uh, loved to hunt and fish. I loved to hunt and fish. And, you know, any time that he wasn't working, we spent together. And then when he was working, I was with one of the four of these unapproachably – beautiful wonderful human beings of love they were all round and heavy set and short but but they they kissed you and licked your face and played got on the ground and played and if i wanted a piece of toast they would make sure that the butter was always to the edge I just and i had an uncle his name was uncle mike who was probably one of the greatest male human beings i ever met so clearly at eight years old losing your mom from a a disease is devastating particularly you know i've heard you describe before it's really the worst age to lose you know you know you knew her enough in, in order to really know who she was and then she was taken from you at really the time that you needed her to nurture you the most because you're conscious at that point yeah clearly that would shape a little boy's life from then on out can you think back at how is there any specific ways that you believe that that did shape who you have become today losing her yeah 
It wasn't, you know, this is... I know get, this is deep, and yeah. I know this is hard. And uh, it, But this th- is the point, Dad. This is what... Okay, people- but listen to me. It wasn't losing my mom. Losing my mom was a milestone. It was losing my entire family. Hmm. I believe with all my heart that if I would have been able to stay in New York, I would have been much safer, way more cared for. My toast would have been buttered, so to speak. But when I... When I lost my mom, I didn't lose just my mom. I lost everything in my life with the exception of God. Hmm. Everything. All my clothes, my toys, my hugs, my kisses, my aunts licking my face. I lost who I was. I, I didn't know anymore. Because I was told that I had all this. I was a genius kid, and you're going to grow up to be the greatest. You're going to be not just the president of the United States. You're going you're gonna to be Einstein. And I was told that every day hmm. by multiple people. It was, it was like a paradise for a kid. And then my mom died. And within two weeks after she died, uh, I lost everything, man. I mean, it was like indescribable. So you grew up in, in a, a small city in, in Utica, New York. New Hartford. New Hartford, uh, New York, upstate New York. And you, when you say two weeks, so uh, approximately two weeks after she passed, what happened? Well, my dad, God bless him, he... Uh, was a alpha male, 82nd Airborne Ranger. That was his career. Uh, military was in World War II in Korea. Uh, was injured in Korea and got a hundred percent disability. And uh, what does that mean? Hundred percent disability. He was a disabled vet. Is that disabled what you're vet? Yeah. So hundred percent got- means that's the highest level Clearly. of uh, uh, financial. Uh, support that you can get from the government you know they grade you by what percent you are um, disabled and he was a hundred percent disabled it's wheelchair basically Uh, he was an alpha male and my aunt Lee was the head of the family the one that was um, that was uh, the teamster teamster. the teamster a teamster boss which is huge um, a huge position and she was like the first female Teamster boss, which is, again, you know, they didn't let women in the, the 50s and 60s, 60s have yeah. jobs like that. And so she was the first. Strong-willed woman. Like, unbelievable. Like, I have so much respect for her. Anyways, um, my dad being an alpha male, her being an alpha female, didn't get along. So my mom was kind of like the arbitrator between them. My mom dies, and the, the very first thing, and now I'm speculating – because I was never, I was sheltered from any arguments, but um, the very first thing is my mom's funeral. What dress is she going to wear? What funeral home? What uh, service? Who's going to give, I mean, there must have been uh, World War III between my dad and my aunt. And I can remember um, screaming just that I've never seen before. So my mom dies, they have the funeral, and um, there was a defining moment I don't want to talk about where I literally had to decide if I was going to uh, stay in New York or um, keep a promise to my mom. When my mom was dying, you know, like about a week before she died, they brought her home. Uh, so she could stay. They didn't have hospice back in those days. And when you died, you went to the hospital, you know, if it was going to be any time at all. And I, I remember laying, they, they brought a uh, a hospital bed into our living room, and she was laying on that, and she was weak, but she was keeping up a pretty pretty good facade. And um, all the Lebanese families were coming. We had a moment, um, and... Uh, 
she uh, grabs me. I remember I was laying on the bed next to her, and uh, my dad said, come on. He, he called me, Will. He said, come on, Will. We got to do uh, your spelling because uh, I was uh, still going to school, obviously. And I said to my dad, uh, oh, dad, I just want to, you know, I, you know, uh, like that, you know, and, and my mom and my dad got really stern with me and said, I told you to go do your spelling, you know, like, like, like aggressively. And my mom, my mom said, honey, please. And she looked at him and, and she never was that type. If, if my dad yelled at me and told me to go, uh, clean the garage, I had to go clean a garage. She didn't undermine. Never. Yeah. They were always one voice. I learned that. Uh, that's important raising kids. And my dad kind of, he didn't get pissed because I, I expected him to say something like, no, I said he needs to do his, you know, blah, blah, blah. Didn't do that. Didn't do anything. And he kind of walked off like um, he was not hurt, but. Clearly dealing with some stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. and I didn't. You'd I never couldn't, seen that. You never, never seen that ever, ever, sure. never seen it ever. Never seen it after that again. Again, it was another, you know, like a point in my life where I, uh, I was tripping, you know, and I turned to my mom like, "Wow, you won that one." In my mind, you know, I didn't say that, sure. you know, but I was like, "Wow, what just happened?" And my mom took her hands, and they were like, um. If you've ever felt a processed rabbit, uh, tame rabbit fur, it's like unbelievably soft. It's like, and my mom had the most unbelievably soft skin in the world, and she curdled my, cuddled my face, and she said, are you listening to me? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, trying to turn my head. And she and she straightened me out, like, with her nails. And she always had red nails. And her nails were done really nice. One of the ants had done them. Or, or, you know, it was a big deal for the ants and this red color. Um, and she, she kind of – and and then I knew that – She meant business. She was yeah, serious. Yeah, she meant business. That's a good way of putting it. And she said, promise me something. And it was always a big deal in our family about promises. You know, you don't make a promise unless you're willing to die to keep it. And I was never, I never made a promise to anybody. I, I wasn't allowed to make a promise. And she grabbed my face and she looked at me. She goes, promise me something. And I'm, and I'm like, you know, in my mind, I was like, mom, you're scaring me. You know, you don't. You've never talked to me like this. You know, I didn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm like, and I just nodded my head, and she says, "Promise me, you'll take care of your dad if something happens to me." And I, I, I remember nodding my head, and she shook me hard, and she said, "Promise me." And I said, "Mom, I promise." I'll take care of dad. What's the matter? And she goes, nothing. Everything's fine. Promise me you'll take care of your dad. And I go, yeah, I promise. You know, and what a mistake. You view that as a mistake? Mm-hmm. Why? What happened, what happened after that that would – because you mentioned two things. One, Number one, obviously that's a mistake, but also that you lost all your safety. What, what does that mean? I lost everything except for Christ. I mean, I was stripped of everything I loved and everything I liked and everything that made me smile except for Jesus Christ. That's all I had. And How did that happen? What would you say? What was the, the events that made that happen? I mean, because if I'm looking at this objectively, I'm saying, okay, well, you had, you know, unfortunately you lost your mom obviously that's a devastating relationship to lose at such a young age but what happened to the aunts and the uncles and your dad that made you feel unsafe and lose all that love many of us cannot understand at such a young age 
Well, the thing is, is a lot of people don't even have uh, uh, somebody that is that beautiful and wonderful or will ever know somebody that, uh, with the exception of Christ. My mom uh, uh, went to the hospital and uh, she died. So clearly, clearly that safety is returned. At what age did you say, I feel safe now? It's clearly hard to talk about. That's a that's a difficult conversation to have, to talk about a, a mom that you loved and a family that you loved so much. Is is it gotten easier over time for any reason, or yeah, is it still? Obviously, I mean, uh, my dad. There's two things my dad and I never talked about. One was uh, God. My dad and I never talked about God. You know. And we never talked about my mom. I, I I heard Dad talk about God, and I heard him talk about my mom, but never to me. Hmm. And, you know, okay, so here I am. I'm seven. I turned eight, uh, uh, in, obviously, in September. And I think it was like the end of March, first part of April, my mom passes away, and um, I'm eight. And, wow, I mean – everything changed overnight i mean like i was uh in, my dad was working at uh ge as a security guard general electric yeah he would uh either drop me off yeah it was just bad i it's just horrible you know because he wasn't talking to my aunts and they weren't talking about him and there was just every time they got within speaking range uh it wasn't how was your day? It was just just a screaming match. I mean, you they were know. dealing. Looking back, what I would assume that is they were dealing with some some tragedy, and they were at the anger stage of grieving. Okay, right. I, you know, <clears throat> yeah. It, I mean, clearly. I mean, yeah. And so, so the way that they dealt with it, it sounds like. And yeah, I'm struggling talking about this. Yeah, I don't. I know. Understand. Well, I don't even know why this so let's, let's, is important. It's you know? important because there's people that are going through the exact same thing, yeah. and maybe there's an eight-year-old boy that's going to hear that and then say, wow, someday I could be – I can have my family back. Someday I can be successful financially. Someday I can run for governor or president or be a congressman or whatever. And this struggle that I'm going through now is hard to deal with and hard to to, to walk through. Yeah. But it's going to get better. And guess who's in charge of that? Guess whose opportunity that is moving forward to change it? His. He doesn't need to rely on anybody other, oh, than, yeah. other than God. Yeah. And so I, that's the story that you need to tell people. Yeah. That. Okay. So you essentially lost your mom. Let me recap here. You lost your mom. You were orphaned because my grandpa, your dad, the first, William Edward Putman, the first, uh, moved you from New York to a small town called Watchersville, and quite frankly, just gave you up for adoption. That's horrible. Yeah, well, that's not exactly how it happened, but it's close. So once once you're living on the streets of Carroll, when did the happiness return? You went through some dark times, and and honestly, we need to get into that. And I don't want to push you today. Yeah, it's, we've we've done enough of that. That's we because you. So you want knowing just you skip. We need to because right. knowing you, we need to just get a little bit at a time. You're gonna you're gonna sit with that for weeks. When did you say to yourself? You laid in bed and you said to yourself, "I can finally relax and I'm happy again." Do you remember? Was there a specific moment where you said to yourself those words? No, I I, I have never said that. You uh, don't talk to yourself. Nah. Do you have an inner monologue? Yeah, but never. do you narrate your own story or no? Because I think in my own voice in my head. Is that weird? You hear voices? No, nope, I think in my own voice. There's a big difference there. You hear yourself? You know, most schizophrenics, they hear whispers. And they see, it's not actual people, they see shadows. What the heck are you talking about? If you want to know when I turned my life around is when I took control hmm. of my life. And that would have been in when I was about 14. Uh, I was, uh, so... My mom dies at eight. From eight years old to 14 years old was the most ungodly, unbelievable, horrible life 
I, I had good times, don't get me wrong, but... For lack of a better term, the dark ages. Oh, man, I just can't tell you. It was awful. And the things that happen are unimaginable. But uh, when I turned, like, 14, I, I uh, got a uh, farming permit that you could get, that you could drive, and obviously everybody took advantage of those, and it was just like you could legally drive as long as you weren't um, – doing something stupid you know and i was living um in town but it was just my freedom my uncle mike uh died and um left me a little bit of money enough to buy uh i'm not an acre of land and uh i i got back with my dad so to speak uh rekindle a little bit of a relationship yeah it was on and off uh through that that six years between eight yeah, and 14? Yeah, it, it, that was mostly off. But it was like when I was 14, it was kind of like on and off. And then uh, he kind of settled down, and we bought we bought this double-wide. He worked for this double-wide company, and he bought a double-wide from him, and we put it on an acre, put in a septic field, put in a well, and um, we ended up being bachelors together. Mm. You know, and he was always my dad, and I always had respect for him. Um, but it was like two bachelors living together. He worked third shift, and I was gone uh, while he was sleeping. I was at school, and that's how that worked, you know. I uh, I don't – it's only God, Blake. I just got to tell you, man. I, I, I just got to tell you. It's just – it was only God that spa- – you know, I mean, because I could have went either direction, man. And, you know, with my personality um, – and some of the gifts that God has given me, I I, I shudder to think hmm. if I would have uh, went in the in an evil direction. What I could have done if I would have went the other direction, if I would have been God forbid evil, I shudder. I mean, if I would have heard voices and and said, hey. Um, I'm I'm a victim and I'm bitter and I'm gonna fix the wrongs that I have been done because I seriously there's some bad people out there man yeah it's a dark time and and, and quite honestly there's a lot of opportunity for you to make that excuse and, and I, what and what and and you know yeah there's, I, so so going through those quote unquote dark ages and then moving into a time of, of happiness, what was what would you say that the way that you pulled yourself out of that? Well, I didn't. God did. There you go. I, I just that's uh, the answer. I was always into for some reason uh growing up Catholic, I, I kind of felt like um um, you know, it's a if you do this, if you do this God reward, will reward you, you know, and, and there's some truth in that. And so you just got to take and understand what God is saying. But um, I, uh, I always read my Bible. I give all the credit for who I am today, you know. And if it, if it wasn't for him, I would, be, I would be nothing, man. Who's your best friend of all time? Jesus Christ. And it is today, and it, and it was then. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, never let you down. It's never let me down. I've let him down. I mean, dang. Uh, just, you know, I'm... Did I'm, money help? At 14, you, you didn't have money. I didn't money. have any money, you know. I, but I, has it helped over the past few years? I mean, you, I mean when you, you, you've said before, there's two things that you've wanted, a, a big family that you're close with Mm -hmm. in financial freedom Mm -hmm. i um i got financial freedom when i was about 34 or 5 in that range but um money does money help no money does not bring any kind of happiness anybody that says that is an absolute freaking fool the only thing money does that's good because it's more bad than it is good okay but the only thing that money does is it's it makes you uh, unbelievably comfortable i mean comfortable you know and money gives you power so 
Uh, somebody could say two things to that, though. Are powerful people comfortable? Money brings comfort and money brings power, okay? And the power that money brings, you can use it for many different ways, okay? If you use it for your personal, you end up like Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden. And I'm not picking on these people, but doggone it, Blake. In what ways has money made you you comfortable? Um, okay, so when I didn't have it and my car broke down, I walked. Simple as that. Hmm. Okay? Now, your car breaks down. What do you do? You either... What do we do? We either go get another one, buy another one. Do you even think about it? No, I actually got a flat tire the other day, and I called Billy, and he, somebody else picked me up. And Yeah, you called next, somebody that worked for next, us. The next morning, it was in the driveway, ready to drive again. You called somebody that works for us. They took it. They fixed it. They brought it home and set it in the driveway. Now... Does money bring comfort? That's what I mean. You know. How does my laundry get done? Megan. My wife. Yeah. She's really money brings comfort. <laughs> a woman that is that beautiful and that wonderful and that loving did not marry you because you're handsome. No. I'm a doctor. I get it. You don't think I know that? Supermodel wife. Is she married because she wants For comfort. Money. <laughs> So the next the next couple of episodes or the we're gonna dive in a little bit more into the quote unquote dark ages, yeah. but I want to hear about some financial stuff too. So we're gonna we're gonna bring Billy on, we're gonna bring Brain on, we're gonna we're gonna understand how you built an empire. That's the next thing. But now we know how you became an orphan, and so we need to figure out how you became built an empire because that's what people are starving for. They want to know how that picture come about. Help me understand how you can raise. Yeah. Do do, do you want to hear? Uh, about being uh, alone mm -hmm. some other day. Mm -hmm. We're going to, again, we're going to, everybody knows now how you're, you you were orphaned and mm -hmm. everybody is now knowing how the story began. Mm -hmm. The next part is, is the teenage years and now, and then the episode maybe after that is, is the family years. And then we're going to talk about how to make money. How, how do you raise a doctor? How do you raise somebody to, to run for Congress? How do you raise somebody to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How do you manage a million dollars? A lot of people ask for a million dollars and have no idea how to take care of it. Yeah. Do you want and it's funny because you, the Bible says, um, ask it in Jesus' name if, if you truly are a believer and God will grant it. And, uh, but he's also gonna, not going to give his son, you ask for food, he's not going to give you a snake, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so I think a lot of people have this misnomer that, okay, I want a million dollars. Just for sake of argument, I want financial freedom. That's a better way. That's and, a lot better way of saying And that. I've been asking Jesus my whole life, and you know what? I have to work like a dog. Well, you know what? You're alive. You're breathing. Hmm. If you'd have been given a million dollars or financial freedom, God would have just... He, he would have been beside himself because you would have gotten hooked on, God forbid, heroin. or He knows what we can handle and what we can't handle. And you, you, you might say in your heart of hearts, I can handle it. I can handle it. And you might be able to, but maybe your daughter, maybe your son, mm. you know, and people say, well, I would, do you love your son or your daughter? Oh, I'd die for him. I hear that all the time. I hear it all the time, but they turn around and smoke in front of them. They get divorces. They, 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 they literally, literally don't spend any time with them. Now, I'm not saying everybody, God forbid. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. But when you say you would die, okay, you would die for your daughter and your son, but you won't quit smoking. You would die for your daughter and your son, but you won't stay married to this woman or this man. And you and you won't work on your marriage so that they can see truly that 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 you could 
you could be happy with the woman that you promised God or the man that you promised God you would take care of? Hmm. You could just break a promise? I, I, for crying out loud. Then you turn around and you ask God, give me financial freedom? Hmm. You haven't even taken care of what you've asked for, let alone... Financial freedom, if you ask God for financial freedom, it's a huge burden. I mean, because I have, what do we have, a hundred and some employees? They all depend every, on Friday. Every week. On Friday, they need money to support their family. And if you want to extrapolate that out, it's not them. It's their kids. It's their spouses. It's their grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. You're exactly right. And, and how to manage that? How do you manage such an empire? You were an orphan. How does somebody that doesn't have that won an award in the mall for having the worst shoes manage a hundred plus employees in a lifetime? How do you how do you flip such a switch? That's unbelievable. That's incredible. How does one person do it? To say, hey, you're a doctor. Congratulations. I have loans. I, the government paid for me to go to school. If we're going to be honest, you helped me get through school. That's not a feat. A feat is is someone that n never had, never knew how to run a business and did it and is continuing to do it and doing it successfully. And it continues to grow. That's a feat. And, there, and there's what I, and I bring, it, I bring this up, there's what false power is about. Hmm. You see, to me, success is not what you're saying. You're saying, hey, Bill, me you have lots of money and oh i look up to that and i and i'm going to tell you anybody can have lots of money hmm. it's an easy formula it's an so simple if you want lots of money here's how to do it you ready you ready this is one statement that will make you never have to worry about money give you financial freedom you ready? Yeah. Never finance anything that depreciates. Always finance anything that appreciates. That will get you all the money you have. Now, will you be a multi, multi, multi millionaire? No, but you will never be without money. You will always have money. That's why that statement, financial freedom, is so significant. I, you, I, I think you underestimate how significant that is because people very often ask for a specific amount of money, yeah. and then that changes their standard of living. But when you falsely, say- Falsely, falsely. Sure. When you say, I want financial freedom, that statement is incredible. And so we need to elaborate more on that. But we're out of time. Yeah. One more thing. Financial freedom, the <clears> definition <throat> is- when you walk into a restaurant hmm. and you order off the menu what you want and don't look at the price, then you can sit back and say, I am either blessed to have somebody in my life that has financial freedom or I... Or a putman is paying for lunch. Have financial freedom. But then you were blessed, right? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Because somebody's paying for your lunch. I love you. Do you understand? Yeah.